Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 3 for MCAT Organic Chemistry. This chapter covers bonding. And specifically, we're going to discuss the following objectives. First, we'll define atomic orbitals and we'll review our quantum numbers. Second, we'll talk about molecular orbitals with a focus on sigma and pi bonds. And then we'll end the chapter by talking about hybridization. This is going to include discussing sp3, sp2, and sp hybridization, as well as resonance. So let's go ahead and get started. Now that we have covered nomenclature from the first chapter and how compounds are related from the second chapter, we're ready to start really examining the real nature of chemical bonding. And bonding determines how atoms come together to form molecules. It also governs the way those molecules interact with the other molecules in their environment. So what we really want to do is we want to start with objective one, which is about atomic orbitals and quantum numbers. Now, an orbital is a region of space around an atom where an electron is likely to be found. An atomic orbital is a mathematical function that describes the wave-like behavior of an electron in an atom. Now, I know that that seems like a pretty complicated definition, but we're going to break it down. Atomic orbitals, they're important in understanding bonding in chemistry because they determine the distribution of electrons around an atom. And this, in turn, affects how atoms interact with each other to form chemical bonds. By understanding the properties of atomic orbitals and how they combine to form molecular orbitals, we can predict the types of bonds that will form between atoms and then how those bonds will behave in chemical reactions. Now, bonding occurs in the outer uh, occurs with the outermost electron shell of atoms. So an understanding of bonding is contingent on understanding the organization of electrons in an atom. Now, I want to repeat that an orbital is a region of space that can be occupied by an electron. All right. And the way that you want to treat orbitals is as clouds of electron density. All right. This is a cloud of electron density where you are more like where you are more probable to find an electron in this region. Now, to better understand the distribution of electrons in an atom, quantum numbers were developed. These numbers, they describe energy, space, and orientation of an orbital, and this allows us to predict the electron configuration of an atom and hence its chemical behavior. Now, modern atomic theory postulates that any electron in an atom can be completely described by four quantum numbers. All right, by four quantum numbers. These are L, N, L, M, L, M, S. All right, we're going to cover each of these now. All right, the first is the principal quantum number. It's denoted by the symbol N. This quantum number can theoretically take on any positive integer value, the larger the integer value of n, the higher the energy shell and the radius of the electron's shell. Now, within each shell, there is a capacity to hold a certain number of electrons. All right. This is given by an equation, actually, mass uh, max equals 2n squared. All right. So that is our first quantum number, the principal quantum number denoted by the symbol n. And it gives you orbital size and energy level. That's the takeaway here. The second is the angular momentum or azimuthal quantum number. And it's designated by the letter L. This second quantum number, it refers to the shape and number of subshells within a given principal energy level. All right. The azimuthal quantum number is very important because it has important implications for chemical bonding and bond angles. The value of N actually limits the value of L in the following way. All right. For any given value of N, the range of possible values for L are 0, 
up until n minus 1. So if your principal quantum number is 3, L can be 0, 1, or 2, and that is it. All right, so that is our second quantum number. Now, the azimuthal quantum number is designated by letters. So L, when L equals 0, we're talking about the S orbital. When L equals 1, we're talking about the P orbital. When L equals 2, we're talking about the D orbital. L equals 3, F orbital, so on and so forth. All right, so those are the first two quantum numbers. The third is the magnetic quantum number. Now, the possible values of ML are the integers between minus L all the way to positive L. And so, for example, if you had an L value of 2, then your ML can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. So from minus L all the way to positive L. All right. Now, this is important, this, this, this quantum number, magnetic quantum number is important because it gives us the orbital orientation, all right? Now also, for example, we know that the possible values of ML are the integers between minus L and positive L, including zero, of course. So for example, the S subshell is going to have an L value that's equal to zero. This limits the possible ML values to just zero. And because there is a single value of ML, there's only one orbital in the S subshell, all right? Whereas the P subshell, it's given with L equals 1, and this limits the possible ML values to minus 1, 0, and plus 1. And so there are three values for ML when L equals 1, all right? When M equals uh, when L equals 1, you have three values for ML, and there are three orbitals in the P subshell. And, you know, so on and so forth. The D subshell has five orbitals from minus 2 to positive 2. All right? And remember, two electrons in an orbital. So S orbital holds two electrons total. P orbitals, that's 3 times 2, so 6 electrons. D orbital, 5 times 2, so 10 electrons. Fantastic. And now the last and final quantum number is the spin quantum number. It's denoted ms. In classical mechanics, an object spinning about its axis has an infinite number of possible values for its angular momentum. However, that does not apply to the electron, which only has two spin orientations. We designate them as plus one half and minus one half. And whenever two electrons are in the same orbital, they have to have opposite spins all right in this case they're often referred to as being paired fantastic so those are our four quantum numbers now i cannot overstate the importance of understanding these quantum numbers all right we go over this in more detail in the general mcat in the mcat general chemistry playlist is actually chapter one we cover quantum numbers and we actually i think build it up a little more than we will here in the mcat organic chemistry playlist but i still want to reiterate all this information because again cannot re cannot overstate its importance all right so again we have four quantum numbers the first is our principal quantum number this number describes the energy level of an electron and the size of its orbital the larger the value of n, the higher the energy level, and the larger the orbital size. All right, it can theoretically take on any positive integer value. Second, we have the azimuthal quantum number L. All right, this quantum number describes the shape and number of subshells within a given principal energy level or shell. It's important. It has really important implications in chemical bonding and bond angles for any given value of n the possible range of values for l is zero up to n minus one all right and the subshells are designated by the letters s p d and f etc all right then we have our third quantum number the magnetic quantum number denoted ml this quantum number describes the orientation of an orbital in three-dimensional space now the possible values of ml are the integers between minus l up to positive l including zero the number of orbitals in a subshell is going to be equal to 
by the way, 2L plus 1. All right, and then last but not least, we have our spin quantum number. This describes the spin of an electron in an orbital. Electrons can have a spin value of plus one half or minus one half. Now, whenever two electrons are in the same orbital, they have to have opposite spins. Fantastic. Now, with that, we can confidently move into the second objective where we explore molecular orbitals. We now understand atomic orbitals. They describe electron density of an atom. Let's now ask what happens when atomic orbitals overlap, all right? What happens? And also, if electrons also behave like waves in addition to particles, what does this look like? So to start, we wanna define two terms, constructive interference and destructive interference. If two electrons, if two electron waves are in phase and they interact, then their interaction results in what's called constructive interference and they produce a wave with a larger amplitude. If two electron waves are not in the same phase, all right, and they interact, then their interaction results in destructive interference and it produces a wave with a node. All right, this is a region where the probability of finding an electron is equal to zero. All right, now let's expand this to bonding, right? Because this might make very little sense without context. So let's expand this to bonding. When two atomic orbitals combine, they form molecular orbitals. Now this is a very complicated topic. And you really won't be tested on a lot of the intricacies of molecular orbitals in your MCAT, but you will be tested on some of the concepts that you that, that work around molecular orbitals. Molecular orbitals are obtained mathematically by adding or subtracting the wave functions of the atomic orbitals, right? That already sounds complicated. You don't need to know the math. The mathematics of combining wave functions is outside the scope of the MCAT. You could would cover this either in a little bit of inorganic chemistry and quantum mechanics. So definitely none of those subjects are on the MCAT. All right. All we need to go over is the basics. And here are the basics. All right. If the signs, if the signs of the wave functions that are interacting are the same, a lower energy, aka more stable bonding orbital is produced. All right. This is called a bonding orbital. All right. So for example, if we take these two s orbitals for example they're both in the same that they both have the same sign of their wave functions all right they're both the same phase if we will all right they will combine to form a lower energy aka more stable bonding orbital a bonding orbital all right now if the signs are different for example here here's a case where this s orbital is positive and this one is negative then what they will form is a higher energy, aka less stable, anti-bonding orbital. All right, and we can look at other cases. So we can we can think of these. I draw these circles with pluses or minus to indicate s orbitals with with one phase versus another phase, plus minus. All right, that's a notation that's commonly used. All right, but you can also have interactions between what looks like an s orbital and a p orbital. All right, and if part of your p orbital, if you remember p orbitals have two lobes, each with a different phase, if you have one side of your p orbital interact with an s orbital that have the same phase, then they will interact favorably. They'll form a lower energy um, bonding orbital like we see here. All right, and you can have even two p orbitals with the with, with the lobes with the same phase interact with each other to also form another bonding orbital. Or what you can have is, you know, two p orbitals that are not in phase interact and they would form a anti-bonding orbital. All right. So again, if the signs of the wave functions are the same, a lower energy, more stable bonding orbital is produced. And if the signs are different, a higher energy anti-bonding orbital is produced. Now, when a molecular orbital is formed by head to head or tail to tail overlap, then the resulting bond is called a sigma bond. All right, all single bonds are sigma bonds. All right, and they can accommodate two electrons. So for example, this right here, 
All right. This is an example, all right, of molecular orbital overlap happening, and the resulting bond would be a single bond between these two atoms with a s orbital, for example. All right. When two p orbitals align, line up in parallel, for example, side by side fashion, all right, their electron clouds they overlap, and a bonding molecular orbital called a pi bond. Is formed one pi bond on top of an existing sigma bond that is what forms a double bond all right so for example if you have two favorable if you have two s orbitals all right they have um, the same sign of their wave functions are the same all right they can find they can form a bonding orbital all right and this formation of these molecular orbitals here all right forms a bonding orbital this is formation of a sigma bond all right, this could be a sigma bond. Two s orbitals for diff from different atoms, they overlap, they can form a sigma bond, aka a single bond. Now, when you have p orbitals overlap, all right, when p orbitals line up parallel, so side by side fashion, like we see here, all right, the positive orbitals align, maybe say the negative orbitals align, there's constructive interference from the top and from the bottom. This makes a bonding orbital. This is the formation of a pi bond. All right, now one pi bond, one pi bond on top of an existing sigma bond is what forms a double bond. So sigma bonds are single bonds, all right? And then a sigma bond plus one pi bond on top of that, that results in a double bond. And you can think about it like this. So if we have carbon, carbon bound to each other, and let's say they're bound to other things, but we don't care about what those are right now. All right, they have other things they're bound to, but we're looking at these two carbons. Well, their S orbitals for these two carbons can overlap to form a single bond. Now, what about if this carbon-carbon was a double bond? They still have this single bond that's forming with the s orbitals of the two carbons, but they also have p orbitals that are aligning here, all right? Let me draw out these p orbitals that align in a way to form our pi bond, all right? And so these form a pi bond here when the p orbitals overlap in, in a parallel side-by-side -side fashion. And so now they have, there's a SS orbital overlap, there's this PP orbital overlap, and we form this double bond between the two carbons. All right, now, unlike single bonds, which allow free rotation of atoms around the bond, bond axis, things like double and triple bonds are gonna hinder rotation. They, in effect, lock the atoms into position. Now, what about triple bonds, you might ask? Triple bonds, are sigma bonds and then two pi bonds. So you'll still have your SS orbital overlap to have that sigma bond, but now you'll have you'll have two p orbital overlap. So here's your first one, like we saw for the double bond. All right, this forms a pi bond right here, and then there's another pair of pi. Uh, there's another pair of p orbitals, and we'll draw this plus coming out in the y direction plus, minus, and there's also overlap here. So a triple bond is two pi bonds stacked with one sigma bond. Fantastic. So that's how we kind of want to understand bonding. And what you need to know for the MCAT really doesn't extend past this. So we don't need to get into the mathematics. We don't need to get into the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and their overlaps and interactions just yet for the MCAT. Actually, not at all for the MCAT, I should say. If you are a chemistry or physics major, you probably will cover quantum mechanics, and then you will definitely learn a lot more about this and about wave functions and how those add up to give atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals, etc. All right. But other than that, that's, that's, that's what we need to know for the MCAT. Now, here's another Im important point really quickly. It is important to remember that a Bond cannot exist independently of a pi bond. Only after the formation of a sigma bond will the pi orbitals of adjacent, say, carbons be parallel and in position to form the pi bond. All right. The more bonds that are formed between atoms, here's something that's important, the shorter the overall bond length. Therefore, a double bond is shorter than a single bond, and a triple bond is even shorter than a double bond. All right. You can kind of think about it like the tighter the atoms, the tighter the atoms hold each other with more bonds, all right, the closer they're going to be together. 
all right? The closer they want to be together. So a single bond is the longest, then double bond is shorter than a single bond, triple bond is the shortest, all right? Shorter bonds hold atoms more closely together, and they're going to be stronger than the longer bonds, all right? Shorter bonds require more energy to break. So it takes more energy to completely break a triple bond than it would to, take a, uh, to break a single bond, all right? Now with that, we can move into our third objective, our third and final objective, which involves learning about hybridization. And to learn about hybridization, we're going to have to set up some motivation for this section by looking at carbon. All right. Now, for example, when you look at the when you look at a carbon and you fill the atomic orbitals of carbon. All right. And we write, for example, the electron configuration for carbon. All right. The electron configuration for carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. All right. And what we see here is that if we're filling up these orbitals based off of our electron configuration, our 1s orbital gets two electrons, our 2s orbitals gets two electrons, and then there's only two electrons in our 2p orbital. There are only two unpaired electrons in drawing our, our electron configuration for carbon. Well, then one would assume that since there's only two unpaired electrons, that carbon can only form two bonds, right? Because there's only two available electrons to pair. However, we see that carbon is actually tetravalent. It can form four bonds. So how do we begin to explain this? Well, the answer lies in hybridized atomic orbitals. And the proof for this is based in mathematics and, again, quantum formalism, which we're, we're not going to get into. But essentially, hybridization is a mathematical procedure that's used to reach a description of observed bonding, right? So, you know, we, we can draw out the electron configuration for carbon like so and realize that there's only two unpaired electrons, but in experiment, we realize that carbons are forming four bonds. So we try to explain this in hybridization as a model, a mathematical model that helps us understand this discrepancy, if you will. All right, so let's start by looking first at methane, all right? This carbon that has four single bonds to hydrogen. The carbon atom in methane forms these four bonds to hydrogens, and this is possible because of hybridization. And for, for carbon having four single bonds, this is how it works, all right? We take the two electrons from the 2s orbital, we take these two electrons from the 2p orbital, and then we hybridize them to form these orbitals that are, their energy level is somewhere between 2s and 2p, all right? We form four of them, and they're called the sp3 orbitals. So we form these sp3 orbitals by combining one s orbital with four with, with three p orbitals. All right. So we moved. All right. So now we've distributed these four electrons that we have to these four sp3 orbitals we just formed by hybridization. All right. So we have one s orbital. 3p orbitals that we've combined to form this new hybridized sp3 orbitals and if we place one electron in each now we see that we have four unpaired electrons that can bind to four different things and this is why carbon can form four bonds now these sp3 orbitals they have 25 percent char uh, s character 75 percent p character now that makes sense because it's from it forms one there's one s orbital 3p orbitals that get hybridized together. So 1 over 3 plus 1, that's 1 over 4. So that's 25% s character. All right, and then 3 over 3 plus 1 is equal to 3 over 4. That's 75% p character. All right, so that's how we explain why carbon and methane, for example, can form four bonds to hydrogens. All right through a hybridization of the 2s orbital and the 3 2p orbitals, we're, we have four sp3 orbitals that have one electron each if we distribute it this way, and now we have four unpaired electrons that are ready to bind to other things, All right? So that's for methane. Now, what if we're looking at something like C2H6, right? There's this double bond between the carbons. All right, how do we explain this? Because here the carbon forms two single bonds, one double bond. Well, remember that a double bond consists of one p orbital that we can we can't touch. All right, the double a double bond is made is formed from two p orbitals overlapping. 
All right, so if we're looking at one of these carbons and we're trying to draw this out to make sense of how this carbon can form two single bonds and one double bond, we have to make sure not to touch one of the P orbitals in our hybridization explanation, all right, because a double bond is formed from P orbital overlap, not hybridized orbital overlap. All right, and so if we're trying to explain the C2H6 molecule, all right, what would make sense is if we take one of, if we take the 2s orbital and only two of these 2p orbitals, all right, and we hybridize these to form three sp2 orbitals, all right, we keep that one of those 2p orbitals we do not touch, all right, that forms the pi bond between the carbon carbon double bond here. All right, and so now what explains this carbon-carbon double bond is sp2 orbitals that form. Here we have three unpaired electrons in the sp2 orbital and one paired electron in the 2p orbital. All right, now it makes sense that the carbon can form two single bonds and a double bond. All right, lastly, we also still want to explain C2H2, right? How about this carbon-carbon triple bond? This carbon forms one single bond and one triple bond. Now remember that a triple bond consists of two p orbital overlaps, all right? So that's two p orbitals that we can't touch. So then we just take one of the two, we take the 2s orbital and just one of the two p orbitals and this forms our sp orbital hybridized, our sp hybridized orbital, all right? We keep one electrons in the 2p, this forms the double, the double, a double bond between the carbon, and then these two sp orbitals form the single bond, as it help form a single bond between the carbons and a single bond to the hydrogen on each side. All right, so in summary, we have sp3 hybridized orbitals. They have 25% s character, 75% p character. They form tetrahedral geometry with 905 Point, uh, 109.5 bond angles. Carbons with all single bonds, those are sp3 hybridized. Then sp2 hybridized orbitals, we have 1s orbital, 2p orbital, so it has 33% s character, 67% p character. They form trigonal planar geometry with 120 degree bond angles. Carbons with one double bond are sp2 hybridized. All right, and then sp hybridized orbitals have 50% s character from the one from the 2s orbital and 50% p character because we only take one of the p characters to hybridize. They form linear geometry with 180 bond angles and carbons with triple bonds or with two double bonds are going to be sp hybridized. All right. Now, the last thing that we want to cover in objective three is resonance, right? We talked about hybridization. The last thing we want to talk about is resonance. Now, resonance delocalization of electrons it occurs in molecules that have conjugated bonds. All right. So you're looking with bonds. You're looking for, for example, atoms with double bonds near each other. Here they have conjugated bonds, one double bond followed by another. Conjugation requires these alternating single multiple bonds because this pattern aligns a number of unhybridized p orbitals down the backbone of the molecule all right electrons can then delocalize through this p orbital system and that adds stability to the molecule now resonance structures are drawn as the various transient forms the molecule takes we're particularly interested in, of course, conjugated systems because it makes it easier to see this alternating double and single bonds and how there is now this unhybridized p orbital down the backbone of the molecule where electrons can move, can delocalize, and that is where stability, um, where there's added stability to the molecule. Now, like we said, resonance structures, they're drawn to the various transient forms the molecules takes. However, these forms aren't in any sort of equilibrium, all right? They they're aren't in any sort of equilibrium um, in terms of the electron density. It's distributed throughout, making the true form of the hybrid, making the true form of the molecule a hybrid of the resonance structures. So if we were drawing the resonance structure for this molecule right here, all right, where there's double bonds, all right, these double, you know, you can draw the resonance structures by moving some of these double bonds over, especially if you have a positive charge here. All right. 
and now you have these move double bonds, for example, all right? The thing here is that, you know, your molecule doesn't look like one or the other in terms of the resonance structures. The true form is a hybrid of resonance structures. So that's a very important concept to keep in mind in regards to resonance. Now, if the stability of the various resonance forms differs, then the true electron density is going to favor the most stable form. Now, particular resonance structures can be favored because they lack formal charges or they form full octets on highly electronegative atoms like oxygen and nitrogen. And then stabilization of positive and negative charges through things like induction and aromaticity can also favor certain resonance structures. All right. Now, for this chapter, this is the extent that we want to talk about resonance. We'll cover resonance again in terms of all the different forms of, of hints to, that tell you that you know, certain structures have resonance forms and how to necessarily determine the most significant resonance structure. Uh, later down the line as we cover further topics. If you are interested in more information on resonance structures, I cover it in the MCAT General Chemistry playlist, and I also cover it in Chapter 2 in my OCHEM 1 playlist, and I do a lot of practice problems there. Now, we're going to do practice problems on all of these topics in the next video, so please stay tuned for that. If you have any questions on the content I covered today, please let me know in the in the in the comment section below i will respond i try to respond to every single question and comment i get other than that though good luck happy studying and have a beautiful beautiful day future doctors